We're going to start this panel, which is on security and online social networks, um, which will be a little bit more of technical nature in comparison to the panels that you saw yesterday. Um, the good thing about, or the interesting thing about this panel, that three of the original authors of the Spion proposal, um, if I count myself four, um, <laughs> are sitting at this table. So I will start with introducing Frank Piesens, who will do the first, who will do the first talk. Um, Frank is a professor at the Catholic University of Leuven. Um, he's working in the group Distrinet, which stands for Distributed Systems and Computer Networks. He's been working especially recently on securing browsers using information flow theory, if you know a little bit about that in, in security theory, um, to mitigate basically tracking while allowing scripts to still run, meaning websites to still function. Um, he will talk about some of the research they've been doing in Spion. Thank you. Thank you, Seda. Can everybody hear me this way? Okay, excellent. Um, so I, I want to introduce two claims that I want to make to spark a discussion uh, in between, I hope, uh, with you and with the other panel members. Um, the two claims I want to make is one positive uh, and one negative. Uh, I'll start with the negative one. So the first claim I'll make, and I'll give you some technical arguments for that uh, uh, in a few minutes, is that many of the privacy and or anonymity related concerns in any distributed software system, so that includes online social networks, but that includes the internet as a whole, and that includes many of the other applications we use on the internet, is, is, cannot be addressed by technical means. Um, so we need some kind of legal back up there, we need rules, we need enforcement that is of a non-technical nature or it will not work. I'll, I will try to explain why I believe that to be the case. So that's a negative claim. Uh, the second will be a positive claim. Uh, I think we can solve some small issues. I think we can improve the situation over what it is today. And one promising um, uh, technical measure there that I believe is worth studying more deeply is information flow security. And I'll, I'll say in two minutes uh, what that is. Um, how it impacts online social networks. Um, and, and I will point to a demo of one of the tools we developed in the Spion project uh, that, that you can then, uh, I hope, uh, visit later. Uh, it's in the corner of the demo room behind you. Okay, so first the negative claim. Uh, why uh, um, can these privacy concerns not be solved technically? Uh, I think the main reason is that in order to solve, if, if, if you want to avoid some third party out there from tracking you, from identifying you, from recognizing you when you visit at different occasions, you have to solve this problem at all the technical layers at the same time. If you miss one of the layers, you're screwed. Um, and and this, is, <laughs> this is different from other security uh, concerns. Uh, many security concerns can be solved in one layer. Um, for example, if you only care about confidentiality of your communication, you can solve it in one layer and, and it is solved. This is not the case for, for tracking-like uh, privacy uh, concerns. Um, so why is this difficult? Well, we have many layers and it's impossible to secure them all. So I have a few on the, on the, on the slide here. Um, if you're in a distributed software system, you need to be on a network, so you need an IP address. Uh, that's one thing that can identify you. You need a machine with an operating system and a processor and they have all kinds of attributes like what processor, what operating system, what version, what software do you have installed on the operating system. Uh, the combination of all these things will again typically be fairly unique for each machine. Um, you have the web layer, uh, this is what the Panopticlick project has, has shown us. Um, so by, by just measuring features of your web browser, what browser are you using, what version, what fonts do you have installed, what plugins do you have installed, what's your screen size and so forth, the combination of all these features again will typically uniquely identify you. The same problem com comes back at the application layer, how do you use the, the application, how do you configure it and so forth. So if your adversary, if the one who's trying to identify you, can uniquely identify you on one of the layers, he can basically track you, yeah? and, and, and that's what makes this so difficult. And I think the final layer, and the one we definitely cannot solve technically, is the, is the one on the bottom of the slide here, which is the human layer. Even if you could make a perfectly non-trackable, anonymous device with which you can interact with the applications, everybody in the world has exactly the same uh, device with the same software and so forth, then still we as humans are unique. 
And, and with enough effort, if you have an application that you interact enough with, you will be uniquely identifiable. If, if only in your typing style, the choice of words that you have, the way in which you move your mouse and so forth, um, if, if the other layers would be securable, then, then that layer is, is, is definitely uh, impossible to, to get right. So, so hence my conclusion, um, yeah, there's essentially nothing we can do technically. Uh, a second cause why I believe, um, for, for technical reasons, dealing with these privacy uh, concerns, and in particular the, the, the tracking issue is hard, is because that if we look at uh, distributed software applications today, and online social networks are a good uh, example of that, um, is that in many important scenarios, the adversary, the one who's trying to steal your information in a sense, uh, can run software in your context. Um, this is the case, for example, if you have a Facebook client on your phone, that software that Facebook gives you that runs um, on your phone in your context. This is the same if you have uh, apps on your uh, Facebook uh, uh, web client. You get third-party software that runs in your Facebook page. It runs in the context of your Facebook page where all your private information uh, is available. And more broadly, this is, for example, true for advertisements that run in any uh, web application. Advertisements on the web are not pictures. They are code. They are full-blown code that runs in the context of the web application in which they are displayed, and they can, they can have access to all kinds of stuff. Uh, in addition, there is plenty of evidence that this power to run software in your context is being abused actively. Um, I, I point to one source, uh, um, at least if it's not blocked by the heads of my fellow panelists. You see um, uh, a pointer to a CCS 2010 paper uh, of people who have done an empirical study and show that of the, of the top 10,000 websites, the most popular websites, a significant fraction of them are abusing this power to send you code uh, to, to steal information, to, to, to have uh, uh, privacy issues, okay? Okay, so that's the negative part. I don't know how to address the first thing, um, the, the, the fact that you have these many layers and that you can be attacked on all of them. I, I've, I've no, I, I think we're, we're basically lost there and I think we need help from, from for example, legal uh, countermeasures there. Uh, I think there is some hope, and that's the positive part of my, uh, my intro here, that uh, the second problem, that we can address it technically. Um, and I, I think one way of, of doing that is uh, using information flow security. So I, I, have, I, I will have two slides explaining you what that is, and I will then point you to a demo uh, that you can follow later in the day. So the essential problem of the fact that, that your adversary, the one who's stealing your data, can, can send you software and run it in your context is that you have some piece of untrusted software here that can read all kinds of things from your phone, from your Facebook page, from, from whatever, and it can do all kinds of outputs. It can show things to the, to the user, which is okay, I mean, that's only to you, but it can also send things on the network uh, to anybody out there. So you have an untrusted piece of software that can read all kinds of stuff and that can output all kinds of stuff. So what does information flow security do? Essentially, it allows you to set a policy that separates everything that goes into the software into private and public data. So for example, um, your friends list, list that the application tries to read might be something private, whereas if it reads to the clock, the current date, whatever, this might be something public. Okay, so, so you have a policy that separates whatever the, the software wants to read into private and public parts. And similarly, you set a policy um, that whenever the, the, the software outputs something, whether this is something that only goes to the user, it's private, for example, it goes to the screen, or it goes to potentially third parties, it goes to the network, it goes to a public output channel. Okay? So, so you set that kind of policy, and then you can see that the, the bad things, the, the, the things you would want, the software that you get into your context, the, the bad things that, that you want to avoid are any kind of flow, any kind of leaks of information from here to here. And that's essentially the goal of information flow security. So they look for technical countermeasures to make sure that if you get such a piece of software, that this kind of flow is prohibited. Okay? Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, just as a finishing slide within the Spion project, so one of the two projects that organized this biennial conference, um, we are building a web browser that can enforce such an information flow security uh, countermeasure. So uh, for arbitrary JavaScript web apps, um, so this works for the advertisement case uh, that, I, that I mentioned before. Uh, we built a special uh, platform on top of it for uh, online social network apps. So things like Facebook apps where third, party, third parties can send you code that run in the context of your, of your Facebook page. Um, and 
Of course, I'm not going to talk about it in detail here. I point you to a paper with some uh, technical information for those of you who are interested. But I want to mainly point you to the demo uh, in the corner of the room behind you. Willem de Groef, the main author of this browser, is available to demo this uh, technology to you if you want. With that, I finish my introduction. Thank you, Frank, for that. I think among technical crews, rather provocative um, <laughs> talk, and I, I really hope that we'll have a good discussion um, afterwards. Next, I'd like to invite Ashkan Sultani. Um, so Ashkan <clears throat> is joining us from the US. Um, Ashkan was part of the FTC for a long time, and he was a privacy technical, primary technical investigator, investigator with the cases with Facebook and Google. Um, some of you may know his work in the Wall Street Journal, um, under the title, What They Know. Further, he was one of the original authors of the Do Not Track um, specification. Uh, he's also the person who, who was one of the first people who identified flash cookies that were being intrusively and without our consent placed on our computers and used for tracking. Ashkan, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Thanks. So, hey everyone, my name is Ashkan Sultani. Um, the talk I'm going to do today is actually not very technical at all. Um, it's kind of going to be a really basic uh, talk uh, on kind of good follow-up, actually, um, discussing trying to identify the different threat models and figuring out when we say kind of online privacy or privacy on social networks, um, what type of information we're talking about and then what type of remedies we're, we're concerned about. Um, and so when we talk about information on these systems on the Internet, um, let me just see. Um, we have kind of, the way I like to think about it is there's kind of three types of information uh, that we really are concerned about in terms of personal information um, or information about us. There's information that I knowingly share with a site or service. This is when I tell Facebook my name or my, uh, uh, you know, age or my date of birth, when I tell, um, you know, a, a search engine what I want to search for. I'm explicitly telling the service uh, information that I want to share with it. Um, there's information that I share via a site or service, um, but that's not intended for that site or service. It's intended for another recipient. This could be an email. This could be a. This could be a. Uh, um, phone call that I sent through an ISP. This could be uh, you know even a public status up update that's. Uh, sent for a certain set of users, but not a wider set of users. Uh, and then finally, there's information that I, that I um, unknowingly share with a site or service. Uh, sorry, unknowingly share that's collected by a site or service. This is often known as third party tracking. This is like um, information where when I uh, browse the web, information is collected about me, like button tracking. And the reason I kind of break it down this way is that um, more often than not, we see the, these things conflated. We see. Um, Hang on, I'm gonna, try to, I'm gonna try to improve this audio. Is this better? Let's try this. Um, so we see these things conflated. We see um, people complain about the first type of thing, uh, about people you know, posting on Facebook, uh, but then they conflate it with, say, uh, Facebook tracking you on the web. And, and oftentimes, the technical me mechanisms we propose on one don't really apply for the other, and we wanna just make sure that we're talking about the same apples and oranges. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I kind of hear a little bit of a, a feedback. Is there anything we can do about that feedback? So it's okay? I think we have a lot more echo here than there. Got it, okay. So I'm just gonna try to block this microphone. Um, so, you know, privacy policies with stuff, this is, you know, the, the first category of information knowingly shared with a site or service, we, we know tons of these. This is people not getting jobs because they were doing keg stands in their photos, and this is, you know, not getting into universities. Um, you know, this was something that I posted the other day where um, in, in a terrorism investigation, they cited participation uh, likes on a particular uh, kind of group, Facebook page, which I thought was kind of a, a big stretch. Um, we've seen, for example, in Iran, I know a particular case where people were denied admission into the country by the customs uh, officers there looking up their Facebook profile and seeing their activity. Um, but all of these were things that we could consider. The user, know the user at that time knowingly shared that information. They posted their drunk picture online. And, and kind of that's kind of a user error type scenario where 
Presumably, you might be able to address this with either use restrictions or address this with user education, right? Um, but that's different from, um, for example, information collected by Facebook um, and shared with other people that you, d you wouldn't expect, right? So I did some work a few months ago showing that when I send a link to another friend in a private message, so this is, I, I send Seda a link that says, hey, check out this website, that link, that information about that share is actually shared with the owner of that website. And so that owner of the website gets to know um, age, demographic, country, this type of information about people who shared their link in private messages, right? And while this information seems like it's aggregate, aggregate it's actually not. I don't know if you can make out the numbers here, but um, there's, for example, you know, one person that's 55 and over that share this information, right? And if you can, you know, correlate this information with country, one, you know, one person that's 55 and over in, in the Czech Republic, that could be potentially identifiable, right? And this is, again, information stored in your private messages uh, shared with other recipients, including Facebook. And this is, um, I don't think most people would realize this, um, that this type of uh, kind of uh, tracking occurs or this, this sharing occurs. We also set, see hints of this um, with the work that Facebook does in offline enhancement. This is where they uh, kind of do conversion tracking, so they're able to correlate the, the ads that you've seen with the purchases you make in, in physical stores, right? So they have a couple data partners. One is like Datalogix, where they'll take your like loyalty card behavior, your shopping behavior in a physical store and correlate it with your um, you know, your, the ads you've viewed or the pages you've viewed on Facebook. Again, I don't think, you know, your, your interaction there would seem likely to be shared, but, but in fact, it's not, it's, it, your, your interaction with CVS is shared with Facebook and vice versa. Um, and then, you know, the like button tracking or any of this other kind of tracking is pretty common, commonly known. This is um, data shared and collected without your awareness. And so we've seen tons of work in this space, you know, uh, you know, you, you don't even have to click on. This is standard third-party tracking. And the type of information is, you know, you're browsing. It's, it's precisely your browsing information. Um, it's exactly the web pages you visited and when, um, your, your click streams, et cetera. One thing that I think most people miss is that in addition to just your, the, the, the like button doesn't just collect your um, browsing activity. It also collects, like, for example, your location activity. This is a, this is a result of a, um, kind of Freedom of Information Act that was here in Europe. And if you, I don't think most people realize that, but if you see um, there's a cookie on the third column and then associated users. So this highlights all of the same users that logged in via the same machine, right? And that's their actual names and their Facebook IDs. Again, this is the result of the like button being present on the machine, but they're able to correlate multiple users tied to one uh, one machine, and presumably you guys either know each other or you are at least at the same internet cafe, this type of stuff. And this is, again, I think information most people don't realize is collected. Um, you know, uh, Frank touched on mobile environments. Um, the, the Facebook mobile app, for example, the one that lives on iOS, it, it has a lot of these similar features in that it, it stays resident on the device, and when your apps um, log in or authenticate to do, you know, Facebook Connect, they're actually talking to the local app. They're, the operating system intermediates that communication, and that, lo that local app then gets to store all of the different apps you've used and how they've connected. So it's, it's kind of like, a, you know, all these uh, ways for one single, um, kind of one single entity to correlate activity across multiple devices or multiple users, which I think most people wouldn't realize. And so ultimately, that kind of, uh, mostly wanted to highlight that when we talk about this inf these types of threats, I think it's important to identify which category of threat we're concerned with and what our remedy is and what our, um, kind of what our approach is. I, you know, some of the, the latter ones can be solved with technical mechanisms, as we've, we've said, um, but the, you know, number two, for example, um, I'm not sure how it would get at, right, so unless we all use strong encryption and we leave no other trace, right, so I, and, and I don't think that's necessarily likely. All right, next um, I'd like to invite Dave Clark. Um, other than his uh, career as an internationally known DJ, um, <laughs> he does join us as a researcher at the Catholic University in Leuven. Uh, he works, his research
research? Yes. Um, actually, if the other panelists also want to sit down, we have a lot of echo up here. It's, um, if you want to listen and you, down there and come back up again later. Um, he's been researching on uh, programming language design, access control, and accountability. And I asked him specifically this morning what definition of accountability he was taking. Because there are, I think in the context of data protection, accountability means something much bigger than what we make, out, make it out to be in, in the technical world. Um, so the definition he was using this morning was technical measures for making parties or persons responsible for their actions. So, Dave. Okay, thank you, Seda. So I'm going to talk briefly about two topics. Uh, both are interwoven with the ideas of privacy and context, which will be briefly explained along the way. The first topic is access control. This is uh, the matter of determining who can access what content in which circumstances in online social software. From a user's perspective, this is the core issue. What mechanisms are available to control who sees my content? Um, access control mechanisms are something that work before the fact. They pre prevent things happening. So, um, but sometimes this is too rigid because you, you, know, you want more flexibility. Um, and the desired audience of the content may not be known until we actually know the content because content evolves over time. So we need to consider also after the fact analysis um, via some notion of audit. And this leads to the idea of accountability. As Seda said, accountability is uh, about making parties responsible for their actions. Um, this is generally enforced by collecting information, so tracing the activities of users or other parties involved, and then auditing this information when something goes wrong. Um, both accountability and access control are ongoing topics of research, so I think we actually have more questions than answers at this stage. So why are we interested in these topics? Ultimately, it's to enhance the privacy um, in social software. Um, but more generally, it's to protect our overall safety in such systems, you know, protect the children and their parents. Um, in real world interaction, privacy decisions are informed by the situation in which the interaction occurs, the parties involved in the interaction, and the potential uh, observers of the interaction. So for instance, if I'm at the cafeteria at work, it's not likely that I'm going to talk openly about you know, a new person that we're going to hire um, because people may overhear me. Similarly, in order to make more informed decisions about privacy, users of social networking sites need to know better about the context in which their interaction occurs. Indeed, our current line of thinking is that access control models governing who can access what and when in online social networks should be governed by the context in which the content or the interaction occurs. So let's consider what happens if the context is absent from such decisions. There are three broad classes of problems originally identified by um, Merowitz. So the context collapse. So in the online social networks, the context is very often ambiguous. You can have a conversation with your old school friends, and then suddenly your mother can jump in and you know, embarrass you or whatever. Um, so this indicates that the two previously separate contexts um, you know, the social context with your friends, the home context with your parents have collapsed into one context. You have uh, the problem of invi invisible audiences. So whenever any context is, any content is posted on an online social network, it's never very clear who is going to see this content. Um, so we have an approximate idea of who will see it when we post it, but because things change over time, we acquire new friends, Facebook changes the policies, um, people share it, we never really know who sees what we post. So we, we can't just determine the actual audience of anything that we've posted online. 
So there's also the problem of the blurring of public and private social, uh, spaces. In online social networks, it's not clear which content is public and which content is private. So conversations that were previously in um, previously offline would, you know, if they were offline, they would uh, take place privately. They may accidentally become visible, publicly visible when we post them on Facebook, for example. So the ongoing work of my uh, student, Rula Sayef, who's at the back somewhere and she will be on a, a following panel, is analyzing these problems in a lot more detail uh, to provide a fine-grained categorization um, in order to open the door for providing technical solutions for these. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that she's been considering. The first thing to note that there is no single-pronged approach to these problems. We cannot simply implement some software somewhere and assume that things will go away. This is very much what Frank was saying. So we're only looking at a part of the solution. So the, the things that we're considering are, are basically about making things more visible to the, the users and incorporating contextual information in the, the underlying access control models implemented in the system um, to protect the users. Um, some of these ingredients are already available in Facebook and Google+. So one of them is to make the audience more visible. That is, make it explicit somehow who can actually view the, uh, the particular content and who has actually viewed the content. Um, ensure that the, the poster of any content is clear. So if you don't know who posted the content, then you don't know the context for a particular interaction, and then you might start posting inappropriate things. So provide explicit indicators of the context. So Facebook does this a little. You have a, a family page, you have a friends page, you maybe have pages that are, are related to your whatever groups you've, um, friend list you've set up. But I think these things need to be made more clear. And the software should be able to help you indicate what kind of context you're in. Here you're chatting with your mother, maybe you want to seal this context so that your friends don't get in and have joined the conversation. So we think that techniques from uh, machine learning, in particular from sentiment analysis, can uh, help the computer to help you keep your privacy. Um, context separation. So more generally, online social networking sites should provide better visual guidance to help users understand the context of their post. Um, if you consider two totally different websites, so LinkedIn and Facebook, you know what kind of posts you're going to make on these two websites. But within a single social networking website, everything kind of looks the same, so I can easily lose track of the context. So I think some work in user interface design can help address this problem as well. Okay, so I, I'm thinking that, yeah, that these notions of context should be incorporated into the access control policies that are underlying um, the way we work with social networking sites. What else have I got? So one of the challenges, of course, is that there is a lot of information in this context. So it's, you know, who's involved, what is the, the kind of discussion that's going on, um, maybe even things like the time of day, and the challenge is really presenting this to the user so that the user can use this information to control what they are doing. So I think there, there will be a, a vast range of techniques that will be from computer science that will go into helping these prob this problem. Some from machine learning, some from user interface design, and I think we'll be relying on human psychology as well. It's a complex problem and it de demands a multidisciplinary approach. So the second issue I wish to talk about a little is accountability in social networking sites. This takes on many dimensions depending on who you want to hold accountable. So the main parties involved are the service providers, uh, the third parties, apps who offer apps, and of course the users themselves. Um, in particular, if you're interested in 
preventing or tracking things like cyberbullying. So accountability can be achieved by logging all of the events that occur in the social network so that any particular state that has occurred in the past can be reconstructed and analyzed or audited. Of course, all the privacy bells in your head are ringing and saying, oh my God, what are you, what are you proposing? Um, so one of the things that we've been thinking about are, are ways of achieving this and pres uh, preserving your privacy. So this is, of course, a, a, an almost impossible problem to solve. So the, the ideas are not avoiding a central store of what's going on. And this would work nicely in a decentralized social network where, where each of the parties are required in a secure log to store the things that have gone on, you know, the actions that they've done, the, the interactions they've been involved in. But this cannot be accessed unless, say, for example, a judge says, we need to look inside this, this log. This is a, a kind of compromise. So what we can do from our side as computer scientists is provide the technical means for doing this and uh, the, the techniques for analyzing it to ensure that you pull out just the, the bit of information you need from these logs to, say, analyze the bullying situation that went on. So it's not fully privacy preserving, but it will make parties accountable. So this is mostly talking about the accountability of the users. So ensuring the accountability of the social networking site provider is, is much, much harder, as is um, dealing with uh, third-party apps. So I, I will not say very much about this, in fact. Um, data protection law is one of the things that's in place to help you there. But I'm not a lawyer, so I won't embarrass myself by talking too much about that. Um, but nevertheless, there, there will be technical means that um, will help people once the laws have been made to say what needs to be collected and what doesn't need to be collected, because there will be vast amounts of data collected and we need to, if something goes wrong, you need to be able to analyze it and find out where things have gone wrong, who's at fault. I, might, I want to find out where my data has gone, but I need to do that in a privacy-preserving way that doesn't tell me about where your data has gone. Um, okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce the final speaker of this panel. It's uh, Claudia Diaz. She is the first embodiment of a professor of privacy in Europe. <laughs> so um, she's also part of COSIC uh, the, the, in the Department of Electrical Engineering at the Catholic University in Leuven. She's a leader of the privacy group where we do a lot of work on anonymous communications uh, as well as identity management systems with anonymous credentials um, as well as privacy requirements. So I will now give the microphone to her. Thanks. Thanks, Heather. So the, the work I'm going to be, <clears throat> the work I'm, I'm, I will talk about today is work that I've been, we're, it's actually work in progress that uh, we are doing with SEDA, so I hope she will be able to qualify or extend uh, anything I miss. Um, so the goal of, of, uh, of this, this article, this paper we're working on, is to do a comparative analysis of different approaches to privacy in social networks. And of course, the diversity is huge. We focus on two sort of main or dominant paradigms on, on how to, to define what are the privacy problems and how to develop technologies that would mitigate or help resolve these problems. <clears throat> so the, uh, basically we find uh, for the motivation or to provide the story, the context of why we need, why we need these technologies, we find two different narratives. So on the one hand, we have uh, very typical reports in the news media of people getting into trouble in their social context, in their work environment, with their family, and so on, because of uh, information they have published in Facebook or in other social network. Um, and typically, in these cases, the, the problems are going to be related to the very immediate social context of, of people. On the other hand, uh, social networks are not only used to keep in touch with friends. Some people are using social networks also for self-organization, 
for contesting their institutions or for protesting or organizing themselves. And um, so more for political action or civil engagement in, in, the, in, in the ruling of the country or trying to, to change how things are done. And of course that it involves also, uh, triggers an interest also from uh, entities that might want to, to, to stop what is going on or to intervene or to somehow ham This is not very good. Yeah. Can you hear me well? Because I, I feel it is on and off. Okay. So, so this other narrative is much more concerned with surveillance uh, in, in social networks and how the fact that people are doing all these things in social networks is opening them to, uh, to, to dangers that come from surveillance. So within these two narratives, we find two strands of research, two, two different types of, uh, of technologies and methodologies uh, to, to address these problems. So on the one hand, we have what we call technologies that try to address social privacy. So a very good example is privacy settings, uh, for example, that um, Dave just uh, talked about. Uh, that are, allow people to sort of manage who in their, in their, of their peers can access or not access information. But of course, these access control models and, and these settings do not protect uh, the content or any information towards the provider. So they, they really are, are fo very much focused on social privacy and not on, on mitigating surveillance. Um, but other examples are, are how exploring how we can, we can design social networks that enable uh, users to develop appropriate privacy practices or that technologies or, or tools that help people make uh, better decisions in terms of who they share, with, with, uh, with whom they share information, uh, and well, for... A little bit back. Yeah. This is... With whom they, sorry, <laughs> with whom they share, when they share, and so on. So, so the decisions that they make uh, with respect to, to, to what information they're sharing with others. So uh, that said, we, we, uh, it, when we talk about the, the, the counter-surveillance technologies, there we find a, a very different uh, type of technologies, such as uh, plugins that help you encrypt your information, and we will have uh, during the TETA TED presentations, uh, there will be a demo that it, of, of a tool that has been developed within our group, which is called Scramble. That based, what, what you can do with the Scramble is that once you have it installed, you can write the text uh, in the social network. Before you post it, it is encrypted so that only your friends can read it, and therefore it is, uh, the contact is protected from Facebook. So note that with respect to other peers, in principle, there is not so much difference with respect to, to, to configuring your settings. The difference is that in this case, uh, the technology that you're using, in this, the encryption, is giving you the ability to really determine who can access and who cannot access, instead of delegating that to Facebook and telling Facebook, I would like, these are my preferences, and then Facebook is in charge of making those preferences effective, of, of making them real. But of course, if they make a mistake, that means that your information gets exposed to others. Uh, other examples, I mean, there, there have been protocols proposed to do like uh, privacy-enhanced versions of uh, systems like Twitter, in which you can privately follow hashtags or, or also be, uh, encrypt your information in a way that only certain followers can read it and so on. And then there is also research on distributed social networks of how we, we can have like radically different architectures that, that really provide, have very strong protection uh, built in. Uh, so the, the premise we, we are starting to is that users might have these two different types of needs. So on the one hand, uh, they, they have social privacy needs. They, they, they have to make these decisions on who to share and, and, and make sure that they don't, they don't do things that they feel, about, they feel bad about later on. Uh, but, and on the other hand, they might also have concerns with respect to surveillance or they might have be exposed to risk, risks with respect to surveillance. So, the, the question is, if we want to have uh, social networking systems, platforms that really address these two types of threats, it would be very nice that these two knowledge bases that have been developed, one coming from cryptography and computer security, and the other coming from uh, human-computer interfaces, uh, but also computer security in the sense of access control is that we are sort of putting together with that category because it doesn't address the surveillance problem, but the social privacy problem. How can we put them together to have systems that protect uh, everything? 
Uh, and the, the, the issue is that this is not really happening. These are pretty separate paradigms. And, and the question that we ask is, okay, if we wanted to, to integrate these two types of technologies, what challenges, what difficulties would we be facing, right? And I'm going to focus on three only. Uh, one of them is, um, we, we, we notice that there are some fundamental differences that are very, very difficult to overcome, and it will take quite some work to, to be able to overcome this and, 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 and have technologies or systems that, that really take into account both perspectives. So the first difference is who defines the privacy problem. So in the case of, uh, of what I call pets, and I'm having a very restrictive definition of, of pets uh, as privacy enhancing technologies, is that uh, there the, the privacy problem is defined by the expert. Because the privacy problem is really based on what information is being exposed in the platform, who has access to this information, and how it can be exploited. And therefore, uh, the experts are the ones who are better prepared to actually um, define these risks and define what the privacy problem means. And usually this is focused on like worst case scenarios and considering uh, a threat model, uh, a motivated adversary who really wants to uh, find information about you and the technology is somehow helping you uh, achieve the goal of protecting it. Um, on the other hand, we, we have uh, th this, in this other paradigm, uh, a lot of uh, the privacy problems are mostly de de uh, defined by the users themselves, in the sense that it's not, uh, the, the researchers don't say, okay, we know what the privacy problems are and we are going to develop a solution, but rather what they say is, okay, we need to ask the users and to find out how they perceive uh, the privacy problems, what, what they are concerned with, and, and this is sort of a first step. So the, the, the privacy definition is coming from the user in one case, it is coming from the expert on the other case. So this is, this, it might be a challenge if you want to design technologies like who are you going to ask or how you are going to combine input that comes from the experts and input that comes from the users who have very, very different views on, on what the problems are. So that's one, one, um, one issue. The other issue is what information is in scope. So when we talk about informational privacy, what information is within the scope or out of the scope. So in the case of social privacy, the information that is in the scope is typically uh, information related to volitional actions, meaning information that users willingly, voluntarily upload into the network. That means the, the, their pictures, their comments, their, their posts, and so on. Um, and implicit data, behavioral data, is uh, bec because users are not making a conscious decision to, to generate this data, are typically much more left out. It's, it's not something people uh, are so much aware of, and it, as, as a result, it's, it's much more difficult to have user studies that focus on this type of information. Um, on the other hand, when we talk about privacy technologies, in principle, we can say, okay, it takes into account all kinds of information, both explicit information, content, but also uh, implicit information, such as behavior, lists of friends, uh, browsing history, and so on. Now, we have to, to qualify that a little bit in the sense that Pets only provide information protection against the adversary, and the adversary in many cases is the social network provider itself. If you have a trusted friend to whom you want to disclose some of this volitional information, these technologies are not going to give you any protection. So once you, you reveal information to them, you know, if they behave badly, there is nothing the technology uh, can do. So that falls out of the scope. Um, and the, the other issue is that um, pets are also typically very content agnostic. They are not dependent on the semantics of the information that you're sharing. Uh, while in social privacy, some of the proposals uh, include, for example, analysis of the semantics or, or the language that is used in the, in, the, in the posts in order to give users um, and I think we, we will hear more about this in the, in the later panels, to give, to give users, for example, feedback saying, okay, what you're saying, you know, might be seen as too, being too emotional, or are you sure you want to use swear words, and so on. So, it, it, to a in, a, in a sense, uh, part of the privacy protection might involve a degree of self-censorship, while in the case, case of pets, privacy is very strongly linked to censorship circumvention in the sense that what the technology aims to do is to protect the content from, so to help you hide the content from anybody you are not explicitly sharing content with, but also prevent other parties 
from uh, interfering with your right to publish or access content. Uh, so, for example, if you're, if you're publishing your posts or pictures encrypted, then it becomes very difficult for Facebook to, to say, okay, this is not appropriate, this is against my morality or whatever, I will delete it, um, so that users get protected in that way as well. Um, or similarly, in some cases, uh, social media sites are blocked in, in, in situations of, of uh, civil unrest, uh, and privacy technologies such as Tor are used then to circumvent censorship and enable people to access the sites. So in, in, in one case, privacy might involve self-censorship, while in the other, um, privacy is very strongly linked with uh, resisting or, or preventing, circumventing censorship. So that, that, that's a quite, it sort of surfaces a very, uh, a difference that might be difficult to reconcile. And finally, the, the third point I want to address is the, the type of threats or privacy threats, privacy risks, and how they are, uh, how, how these different paradigms think about them. So in the case of, of privacy technologies, uh, typically uh, we follow a risk-based, risk-driven approach. So it is not about concrete harms that happen, it's about potential harms. So the premise or the thinking is that once your information is out there and all these, entity, these other entities have information on you, since information is power and you don't really have any means to control how they will use it, then um, your privacy is already at risk and bad things can happen. So the goal is to prevent the information from becoming available. Um, and of course, when we get, on the, in, on the other hand, the, the, in social privacy, the identification of privacy problems is very much driven by harms, in the sense that uh, when, we are, when users are asked about what privacy problems do you encounter, they are typically going to come up with um, uh, problems that, in which the, the causality is very clear of uh, an information that they disclosed or an action that they took that, that led to something bad happening like somebody was angry with them or they lost reputation or they were misunderstood or, or whatever. Um, so this is very, it has to be very intuitive for users to make the link. Uh, while in the case of abstract harms um, that, that might be de derived from this mass collection of information in, in this risk-driven approach, um, we, we are not really uh, focusing on, on concrete harms, but abstract harms that could happen, and this could be from uh, information about people that they would like to keep hidden, becoming uh, inferable through other information that is available in the network, such as sexuality. There's the f famous uh, article, that, or famous work that basically could do that. Uh, but it's not only about individual uh, harms, but also we can think about soci more societal harms in the sense of how society might be changed through the use of these uh, surveillance technologies in, in the sense of becoming more unfair. If we have, for example, if this information is used for, for discriminating people, or whether having uh, states that have this uh, increased power might. Uh, change things towards more authoritarian uh, types of, of, of government. And I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, now I'll put yet another hat on and be the respondent of this panel. Okay, um, I think... <laughs> yeah. Okay. If um, the, what will happen a lot today in the different panels is basically you will find engineers, but also people who are working with engineers, looking at the problem of privacy or the problem that gets articulated under the label of privacy and translating that into a design problem. So either looking at what kind of technical systems we have developed and how they are maybe causing some of these privacy concerns and then thinking forward by saying, how can we take some of these concerns and given these technical conditions, how can we change the design to actually mitigate some of those concerns? Each of the speakers, I think, took a different definition of privacy. And what I'm going to try to do in the, in the response is try to 
formulate what, what I think are those different definitions. So I think when, Frank, you were talking about privacy, it was a matter of tracking, right? It was very much about um, not being aware or maybe even being aware and consenting to, but in most cases, I think unaware tracking and, and stealing of information. And I think one of your assumptions was we cannot have any sort of privacy guarantees if people can, or companies or organizations can track people or steal information. I think this was your underlying model. Now this contrasts very much with, let's say, legacy systems and privacy, which have to uh, function under data protection rules, which means they need to make their um, data collection and processing activities transparent, where you would, do, you would use maybe an access control system to make sure that within the company that collected the information, only those who are um, authorized see the information. Um, and it doesn't cover things like accountability that Dave was later talking about. So it's a very specific um, definition of privacy, which I think applies mainly to the web interactions and mobile interactions. So I think that was, that's where I would see the distinctive part of your work. Um, this was followed by Ashkan, which I think was following a very similar line of, of what privacy means. Um, let me see if I can go back to my notes here. And, and I think what Ashkan did in, in addition um, was to introduce a sort of third actor, so not somebody that, that only looks at privacy constructions and not only thinks of redesign of these, but is a kind of investigator of infrastructures to see what kind of tracking is happening, an expert who can read what kind of problems arise, which I think I'll come back to later on. Um, in Dave's talk, we went back to the access control and contextual matter. Um, here again, we had a lot more of how institutions manage users' data, as well in the case of social networks, how users manage data among themselves, between themselves. And in a sense, what happened there was that privacy became a matter of decision making. So how can we improve the access control such that users can make good decisions about what information to disclose in which context. Again, this is very different from privacy is violated because we have tracking. This is very different from privacy as a matter of certain transparency measures within organizations. It's, again, it's much more about individuals using these services and making informed decisions about disclosures and concealment. Mm, I think there was um, in, in Claudia's talk, what was somewhat subtly there um, was a relationship to law and law enforcement. Um, I think that in the access control models that Dave was talking about, he was talking about accountability. Um, and it was very interesting that you, you made the accountability of users and accountability of service providers. And I think it would be very good in the discussion to hear what you think about the difference between those two things. Um, accountability within computer science almost always brings in tracking where information went. So while in Frank's world, tracking was a bad thing, in the accountability measures in Dave's world, tracking is a good thing because you can see if the information was misused. Okay. So they're both talking about privacy, but you see that the same technology is, not say, let's say technique, not technology, is one seen as an intrusive thing and in the other scene as a protective thing. Okay. Um, and I think there's also further that if you want to do accountability and audits, um, you not only have the tracking and therefore surveillance problem, but I think you also talked about the security issues. So who can have access to the logs? Who can make a decision that an abusive use of the information was made? And you talked about judges making decisions. And there we open actually another question, which is, who is accountable for the accountable use of accountability logs, right? So we've got a bit of a um, recursive problem there um, that may be nice to talk about later on. I think Claudia was talking a lot about normative definitions of privacy, who gets to make them. Um, she was talking about experts in the security community deciding what is normatively good privacy behavior given certain technology and talking about some of the user studies, we try to make no normative assumptions, but puts you know, some of that decision-making into the hands of users through user studies. 
um, in uh, Frank's talk, he was also talking about policies, that the browser would have the option of making something public and private. And I think what's interesting there is that the normative decision is put into the policy. So whoever makes the policy is actually making the normative decisions about what can be decided upon as public and private. And I think it would be good in the discussion also with all of you to see where we make normative decisions as designers. So we have a very specific responsibility as engineers. We look at these real world problems and we put them into systems. And, it, and we're often not explicit about when we make normative decisions. So I would ask all of our audience to critically uh, question and scrutinize when we make normative decisions. Now, I would also argue that the Facebooks and existing social networks of this world make a lot of normative decisions about what is appropriate disclosure, what is appropriate concealment, what is an appropriate interaction. And I would even say that designers who are looking at nudging, which we will hear about later, um, or designers looking at um, you know, giving uh, feedback to, to users, for example, about the context, as Dave said, also make a definition, normative definition, about what is appropriate context and what is appropriate feedback. And I think we have to also not think that just doing user studies means that we don't make normative decisions in design. So I hope we can critically assess that. Um, coming back to law and law enforcement, I think Claudia was trying to draw out that in certain privacy research traditions, the relationship to law and law enforcement is very, very different. So while in the access control world, um, for example, you would find that researchers will talk about accountability, they will talk about the judge walking in and making good decisions. Therefore, there's a collaboration with the law and law enforcement to make sure that systems run properly. This is also very much found in data protection, where the data controller is always a trusted entity that needs to be transparent. Whereas in the security engineering, data controller is called the adversary. Law enforcement is called the adversary. So the relationship is a very different one. Law enforcement is the one you want to basically get out of your communications because they're snooping on you. So I think it's also very interesting to see which kind of stakeholders our designs involve and, and trust and which of the stakeholders are actually pushed out depending on which kind of privacy solution you're looking at. Um, I think what um, in a sense, both Dave and Ashkan are also doing, are, are using machines as a way to also give us feedback on what kind of things are going on and how we can improve our decisions in the future. So I think that brings a very interesting question. Can we trust the machines um, to give us help in assistance in, in our privacy or other matters in interaction with these systems when we actually suggested that the systems were causing the problem to begin with. So I think this is an interesting debate to have. Um, I would say that the whole control discourse is about who's going to control whom. Are we going to control the machines or are the machines going to control us? And I would hope that we can go beyond in the discussions, that it's not about one or the other, but it's about interacting with the systems and being aware that these systems are built by engineers like ourselves, who hopefully also sit in rooms with much more uh, people who can ask critical questions about some of the technical decisions that they're making. Finally, um, I want to come to one of the main themes of SPION, uh, which, which we call responsabilization. So we're very worried, actually, about the privacy discourse or technical privacy measures, which suggest that the user is the main responsible for mitigating risks associated with privacy. So we're trying very, very hard to think, okay, who is causing these privacy risks or who are, who are the ones that are causing the privacy problems and how can we push back on some of the issues they're creating? So how much of the problem is that users are the ones that are not protecting their privacy right, and how much is it that service providers are not doing a good job with designing systems that don't require users to constantly watch out. So if I can go back to the talks again, I think when Frank was talking about the need for security and privacy at different layers, he was right on the nail, he was hammering the nail, saying, you know, if 
Facebook does not design their login securely, if Facebook does not design their databases securely, there's not much that the user can do. So these things have to be taken into account. If the protocols that we're using to communicate are not done well, then they're going to leak information. We cannot expect users or make them responsible for information that is leaking as a result of what I will for shorthand called infrastructure, although I'm aware that this is a shorthand and not um, showing the complexity of the matter. Um, I think the, the work that you have done with FlowFox, uh, using information flow security and making sure that the browsers are not leaking information, I think is a wonderful example of how the infrastructure can be improved so that the users are not leaking information. They cannot control this. This is out of their control. Claudia was talking about security systems like anonymous communications or Scramble. I think there, um, the idea is that you do, the user does not even have to trust other parties, um, therefore making it, again, less leaky, not allowing the machines to take over without us, but also, in a sense, giving, saying that we need alternative infrastructures so that the users don't always have to protect themselves, that these infrastructures, if you use them, they're going to guarantee that no extra persons are listening into your communication, no extra persons are able to abuse your information in ways you didn't expect. So it's about providing an alternative infrastructure that takes care of that for the user. I think Dave's work addresses the responsabilization as well in the sense that access control is originally something that was made for system administrators. System administrators were usually people who had many years of technical experience, if not a technical education. So now in social networks, we're expecting users, end users, to have the qualifications of a system administrator. And I think the idea of improving that, that task by making it more accessible, um, using HCI methods, using machine learning, um, giving information about the context, I think is the way that the system can be improved to de-responsibilize the users. Um, and as I said, with respect to Ashkan's work, I think it's very much, um, we've been doing, for example, some work on, can we make visualizations of tracking? Can we give feedback to the users on tracking? And I think one of the problems we run to is, how do we manage not to overwhelm the end user when we give them this information, especially since we don't really yet see through the complexity of tracking that we have. And I think, Ashkan, your work is very much about that expert who goes into these systems, um, into, into observation mode that an end user cannot do, and makes the tracking visible and understandable to the end user. And I hope that you can talk a little bit more about that. Thank you. So, do you guys want to respond to some of these things or yeah, pick up on some of them? Frank, do you want to start? Yes, I'm happy to begin on some of the things uh, that, my, that you and my, my colleagues on the panel here have said. Um, so, I'm afraid we, we agree on a number of things, which makes discussion um, hard. One thing I, I, I wrote down as a question after hearing the, the discussions and the summary of it is, um, so I think we agree that technical solutions can only be partial. They can, you can make them better, but, but they're only partial. Um, so one question we could ask ourselves, and since this is an interdisciplinary um, audience, maybe some of the people in the audience have opinions on that, is in, to how far can we just uh, live with this, admit it? So, so um, how quickly will people adapt their behavior once they have been harmed a few times? Um, I think people are good at that. It takes maybe a generation, uh, but yeah. So what in the long in the long uh, in the long term of things? What is one generation that gets that gets hurt a bit? Uh, I, maybe there are sociologists in the room that have some opinion on that. So I think I'm, I'm a technologist. I understand. I think what we can do technically. I think other people on the panel too, but I'm not sure what to do. So I don't think we can make an online social network feel, look and feel the same as a real social context. And so we can build software that helps us make decisions. We can put some, some technical means in place that will protect us a bit, but by no means fully. So should we give up? But fully, fully from whom? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> 
So, I, I, well, I would say anybody who has, who wants to, for example, track somebody. If I want, if I want to know, in on the internet, that when somebody visits me, it's the same guy as it was two weeks ago, and when you visit somewhere else, I want to know that you're the same guy too. I think anybody who wants to do that can do that today. No. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's, I think, one of the few solutions that we actually have. No, right? you don't have it. <laughs> no, people are tracking you. So, 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 um, uh, I think you guys need to be specific uh, about the solutions you have. Of course, I agree you that you can, you can um, make it harder and harder, but you cannot solve it, compl you, you cannot solve it um, completely, I think. Even, uh, uh, so, I, I don't want to attack any yeah. specific technical measures, but both Flowfox, my own system, as well as Scramble, no, I'm talk I, I was talking about Tor, actually. About? Tor. Yeah, okay, so Tor. For uh, tracking. <laughs> uh, I, I, actually, uh, uh, one of my students did, a, did an investigation on, on tracking over the summer and found that anybody who uses Tor is more uh, trackable than, than, than the people who are not using it. So, the fact that uh, you can, um, by, for example, running a script in your browser, you can learn a lot of things about somebody knowing who he is, including the fact that he's using Tor, and there's only a few percentage of the people using Tor, so you, you, become, you, you stick out like a sore thumb. Oh, this is one of the, the privacy people. This is one of the half a million people who use Tor. Sorry? This is one of the half million people. Yeah, who out use of Tor. the six billion on the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, right. So then this specific identifying feature goes away, but there are, there are plenty of others. That's, that's how it Can we give a microphone here just a second? Yeah. So this goes for... Uh, so again, I'm, I'm not saying that to downplay the technology. I think it's important that these technologies are there, but I, I cannot convince myself as a technologist that we can make them foolproof. No, foolproof, no, you can, yeah. you can, and they are constantly improving the system because constantly there are new attacks that are found and, and need to be fixed and uh, it's, it's, a never, it's a process, it's not like once you, you, you achieved it and then it's over and, and you can just leave it there and uh -huh. it works. But I do think that, that we can, I mean, compared to not using any kind of protection, I think the difference is very, is very significant. Yeah, you stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, it, it depends who, who your threat model is. If the threat model but is the is the, is the end website, then I think it's quite difficult to to locate. Uh, and I mean, Tor is also, as, as you said, you have to protect in all layers. So now they also have like a Tor browser that also does sanitization of requests. And I mean, it, it's not just the, the rerouting is more. I, I agree with that. So I agree that the threat model is important. And, and for certain threat models, Tor gives you a good protection. Uh, I think for the way in which the internet is used today, it doesn't give you enough protection yet. Ashkan, do you want to? Yes, so I think this is an interesting debate in that, um, yes, you can ultimately, you know, there's, it's a cat and mouse game whereby there will be different identifiers and depending on your incentives, you can come up with different mitigation techniques. But the issue is, I think, you know, it comes down to incentives and usability in the sense that, like, for most people, I don't think they have that much incentive to participate in Tor, especially if it gives, or, not even Tor, let's just leave that up, just participate in some of these privacy-enhancing technologies in that, one, the, um, the threat model for them is quite low. They don't actually kind of, a privacy risk will be different until you experience it, and, and it's often a retroactive thing, right? It's kind of like you know when you see it after it's happened. Um, and it often results in a degraded user experience, for example, and even if you have a great user experience and the current state of the art is such that um, you're able to mitigate most of the known threats, the incentives on the other side to mitigate no other techniques to, to, uh, to track you or, or to identify you uniquely is quite high. And we talked about this on the walk over here. Um, oftentimes, this debate is framed around, say, behavioral advertising and, and the want to know your behavior to sell you things and this kind of thing. And while that is true, that is kind of the future of advertising, that's actually the core principle on a lot of the internet ecosystem is that uh, unique identification is the currency. It's the, it's the, uh, the, the, the money by which 
the way by which money gets exchanged, right? So if I'm an advertiser, um, I pay my ad network based on the number of unique impressions, right? So that's the number of unique visitors that come to a website, and then the unique conversions, how many of those convert and buy or do some, some such thing. And that's actually in this ecosystem a currency. It's like money. Like I, if I can prove one million uniques, I get like one million dollars, or I get a hundred thousand dollars. And that variability in that ecosystem is actual real dollars or real euros, right? And the issue is that the incentives on the side of um, a lot of these systems to uniquely identify people both for you know, getting paid as a, as a currency as well as other things like security and fraud and this type of stuff are quite high. And so while there are technologies that will mitigate and do quite well, there will always be more incentive, I, I find, on the other side, given that there's so much value associated to this uh, information to come up with new techniques that uniquely identify and uniquely track users. So I think the question of incentives is one that's, that's, quite, that, that's, that's, that's quite large. Um, I have one other point, but if you want to answer them. No, no, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, no, I, 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 I actually agree with you. Um, <laughs> so in a sense, you answered the question, uh, Claudia asked, um, so who will do this? Well, you answered the question. I mean, there's money there, um, so, so somebody will want to uniquely identify you? I, I, I agree on the, on the general point, but I don't agree completely in the sense that I think the incentives of, of, of the entities who are performing tracking, they are not really concerned about capturing 100%, I think, of people. Uh, so I think in that sense, there is a bit of a paradox in the sense that if privacy technologies that, for example, prevent tracking in some way are used by a small percentage of people, then the incentive is not so strong to spend a lot of extra money or make a lot of extra effort to, to cover this last... I completely disagree. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, okay. so, like, one of, the, one of the reasons, you know, when you... I was at a conference yesterday and someone was pre pre presenting one of these great technologies that do tag management. Do you guys know what this is? Where in, so, you know, a lot of my research has shown that when you go to a website, there will be, you know, 60 different third-party trackers uh, tracking your activity on that website. And so there's a bunch of solutions out there to say, well, let's have one central tracker and, and then everyone can create smart ACLs, uh, access control rules of who gets information and what kind of aggregate information is provided. And in theory, it's really sound. It also speeds up the web because you don't have to load 30 uh, you know, or 60 different objects. You just load one. It can be for the first party. Um, this is all great in theory. But the incentives are not there also from the side that this is also an industry that does not trust one another, right? So in fact, the way it works is I want to put a pixel on my page to measure the number of uniques, to measure the number of impressions and such, such that when you give me a bill and there's a contention of 2% where you, uh, I, can, I can kind of verify that I got a different number than you and he got a different number and the two of us match in our number. So I owe you less, more or less money depending on what that outcome is. And the, it, the, the push to be more and more accurate, more and more complete is quite huge. Okay. So I, I actually find um, one of, the, one of this, these, these pushes to things like Facebook and Google sign-in and such, they become the holy grail in terms of unique identification, right? So you push into identity, kind of the identity space where you can now uniquely, instead of trying to guess what a user is based on some attributes of their browser or their attributes of their cookies, you now have a strong identifier that they've used to log in with and they can reliably identify them as a unique person. Um, that, and that even helps this ecosystem further because I can say, you know, Claudia, you know, you, you browse on the web and then you bought this thing at Save-On and then you also logged in from your mobile device using the same identifier and now I know exactly what your coverage is and exactly um, how much I'm owed in terms of my ad dollars. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push a little bit back on the incentives uh, discussion and in, into your field. So I think the argument, if I heard mm -hmm. it right, Ashkan, that you made is that most people do not have the incentives to use something like Tor. Uh, it's an overkill for their threat models, which is almost non-existent. Um, I think this is a little bit what we're trying to do in our paper, to show that there are people at different times that actually um, hit that threat model, although they might not be always there. So, I mean, usually people like to talk about you know, the activists in an authoritarian regime. It turns out that our, our regimes can also kind of twist into an authoritarian curve sometimes, actually more than they should. Um, and, and also that 
even the activist is not a 24-hour activist, etc. But that's one discussion. So I want to go back to a little bit to maybe DNT and browser security. So I can understand that the industry does not have, and the users don't have, the, you know, the very normal user does not have incentives to use Tor. But I think a lot of people have good incentives to have secure browsers. I think we have a lot of incentives to have browsers that are not leaky. And I'm just wondering, to, I mean, it's to both of you, Frank and Ashkan, um, what, what are the incentives what, and why are they not happening? Or where do you think um, even technologies that these service providers are using are being so leaky and so, so well, problematic in many ways? There's one quick point, which is um, three of the four browsers are funded by companies that are uh, ad companies or funded by ad companies, right? So Firefox is independent, but quite a lot of their revenue, or quite a lot of their money comes from Google and the Google search bar. Um, Microsoft has an ad network, and Google is an ad network. Uh, Safari is the only um, browser that doesn't have an ad network, if you don't count the mobile stuff. And they, incidentally, are the only browser that blocks third-party cookies by default. Right? So you know, in the sense of why these th features are not enabled, um, I think it's part of the, the way the ecosystem works and who provides your browser. So if someone were to build and spend features on building, and I've tried to push uh, Mozilla to do this, because they're in the perfect position to do this, to build the user's browser, which is like the privacy settings that most consumers would expect. Um, and this isn't just like turn everything so it blocks everything, because most users would then get really mad and say the web sucks, right? But come up with a set of the, the balancing principles uh, for most users uh, that, that kind of work well enough to where they can use the web and do the things. Like, most people actually like the like button, right? Most people want to be able to like, comment on, on, on things. And so you want to maintain some of that functionality without all this side channel leaking of information. Um, if someone were to come up with a browser that was extremely usable and, and had a release cycle that matched the other browsers and did really well, I think that would be a really great outcome. But the incentives on the current browser makers are not there, right? Because they get funded by advertising, I think. Yes, so, uh, so I agree. that It's the classical paradox of functionality versus security, I think. So the, the best way, if you just think about um, the, the tracking problem and uniquely identifying a browser, the best way would be if everybody used exactly the same version, configured in exactly the same way of exactly the same browser. And, and this, is, this is not what people want. Uh, so the more variability you have, the more features you have, the more difficult it gets to control leaks. And this is just on the example of, of, of tracking, uh, but it goes uh, leakage of other information too. Uh, there is a trade-off you have to make between how much your browser can do, how fancy it is, how flashy it is, and how secure it is. And, and, and this is a classic trade-off that usually functionality wins. Uh, Dave, what do you think would be the incentives to pick up an elaborate access control model like the one you're developing now? Um, well, I think it's, because you mentioned that privacy was about decision-making. I think it's empowering the users if the users have more control over their, say, privacy settings. But as you also mentioned, that this will overwhelm the users, so they need to have these other tools, such as good um, user interface design, um, machine learning techniques, that that actually work with them. So the machine learning things would know about privacy, but they will do what the user wants, adapt to the user's behavior. So I, I think the, the users will need this extra power, but they also need it presented in a way that it doesn't appear more complex. And I think that's where the main challenge is really from this perspective. You can have the policies you want, but it, you don't want to go through 16 pages of checkboxes to have Claudia and Ashkan. I would think that actually the incentives of, uh, of uh, social network providers such as Facebook to improve uh, their access, so to make their access control models easier to use are actually quite big in the sense that they want users to feel comfortable, they don't want users to be exposed to conflicts uh, by using their system. and also by addressing those issues, they somehow take out of the limelight other privacy issues that might be more related to their uh, collection of everybody's information. So I would think that economic incentives for 
uh, making access control easier to use should be actually quite strong. So, so I agree that if users have trust with the network, then they're more likely to, to share things. Um, but not in the lines of, of like, you know, so some of these scramble type plugins or the plugins that remove the ability for the content, for the, the, for the network or the provider to monetize content is uh, contrary to the social networks and incentives, right? So providing a rich API for which you can post messages that Facebook themselves cannot read is not in the incentives of, of the network, right? And, yeah. and if they were in agreement. Just I wanted to push back on one thing there, which is um, the user choice thing for me is always like this red herring, right? And, and I, can't, I, I, I counter it with the, the cute cat. Uh, you know, I always say if, you, if anyone shows uh, user choice, I always say show a cute cat, right? Because people love cute cats, and if it's like, do you want to block cookies and see this cute cat? Or maybe read an article, maybe actually something really interesting, like if you want to get access to content, right? If you want to read this New York, and there's already a, quite a few sites that say if you block ads or if you block, you know, cookies, they say well, you're not able to, to read this site. Please, you know, I think Ars Technica did it, Salon sometimes does it. Um, and when most users, again, based on the risk model, for, for people that are not the Tor community, for people that don't have a specific threat model in mind, if the idea is um, allow third-party cookies or allow third-party tracking or sign in with Facebook um, in order to read this content, um, most people would be like, oh yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know what the problem is with third-party cookies or I don't know, uh, and I wanna see this content. And I think in that, in that paradigm, most users currently will give up whatever, you know, they'll give up their, you know, whatever, their, their mother's maiden name for a, for, you know, a cute cat. And, and a final uh, risk, I think, with having the machine help you, so if you have, say, a wizard that helps you making decisions, is this will be used for social engineering. So people will get used to this wizard, others will copy it, and will then uh, advise you to leak all information and, and you will not have... So there, there's a, the example that some of you may know that when browsers in, in, in included the green lock to show people that something is a secure site, that th there's a study that shows that what people learned from this is to trust this particular brand of green. So whenever they saw this green, the, the, that's the same green as the lock, they said, oh, this is a very trustworthy site. So, so I, it's, have the machine help you making decisions has a number of risks th that are very difficult to get under control. Actually, that goes to my uh, last question before going to the audience. So if we would, uh, you mentioned different times, Ashkan uh, mentioned cat and mouse game, um, arms race was one of them, now you talked about wizards. So if we looked forward to the future, so if we think about a science fiction future almost, or maybe a real one, can we say that it's going to be a war of the machines, the, the privacy-loving machines and the privacy-intrusive machines? And if, if this is what we're doing, if we're putting machines that can help individuals or communities with their privacy issues. What kind of trust assumptions are we making there about us, about these machines, and about what they can achieve? Ashkan? Yeah, so I actually take a slight spin on this, where um, I've heard a talk, I think Bruce Schneier gave this talk, and he had a compelling argument, which I've been buying more and more, which is that the future won't be about trusting machines, it will be trusting um, corporations. So I trust Apple to protect me from Microsoft and Google, right? And you might trust your, your Microsoft machine and you, you, or, you know, Firefox or whatever the association is. You, you trust a brand to, to take care of your, you know, your protection. The same way we might trust a bank to keep our money safe from someone else. We might trust these either identity providers or software providers or browsers or computers to um, look after our own interest. Um, and I think people do this today, right? So like, I use Gmail and I actually think they have the best operational security of any, uh, you know, kind of web company. They have the best security team, um, but they also probably harvest my information for their purposes the most. And so this is, it's trade-off where I, I, protect, I trust Google to protect my information from like Eastern European hackers that are trying to get at my credit card information or law enforcement from getting my, uh, you know, my browsing history or whatever. Um, and that trade-off is by me giving my information to Google uh, to, to be my custodian, right? And I think that's a, that's a future we might, we might see. I, I think that's a beautiful observation, and maybe that's one of the ways in which uh, society will handle these kind of things. So I'm interested, since this is an interdisciplinary group, 
if there are people with a, with a kind of sociology background also that have an opinion on this. So in the long term, we, people have learned to organize themselves in a way that they deal with threats and maybe trusting organizations is one element of that. Um, I agree that this is happening already today. Everybody trusts at least, at least their operating system vendor for everything they do on, online. Um, but maybe there are other ways in which yeah, society could adapt um, and maybe they lead to different kinds of technical problems we need to solve and, and that's something that, that would be interesting to learn about in, in, in the long run. Okay, I think we have geeked out enough. All right, so now we'd like to turn the microphone to our audience. You did hear appeals to legal partners, sociologists and policy makers. I hope that if you're something else, you still speak up. Absolutely. All right, here we go. Um, James, we have a microphone. I'm James Rule from uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, I have a, a bit of a follow-on to the uh, remarks from the engineers, uh, and it, it's a kind of critique of the way the notion of privacy gets used. It's such a squishy idea. Uh, a number of you have evoked uh, privacy as a kind of outcome of different ways of relating to uh, the web or to social media. And people have said, well, some person, some, some users m contrive to have uh, good privacy and others are opening the way for privacy wounds. You know, they're running great risks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in other words, uh, this is a talk about privacy as something that happens to individual users discreetly. And that's, uh, of course, it's not a crazy idea. You know, some people keep good control of their information and others don't. But I'd like to propose to you that uh, there's another, uh, at least equally important, uh, sense of the word privacy, and that's a, a kind of holistic sense. That is, uh, can we compare, shouldn't we compare, different societies or polities in terms of uh, the, uh, the strength of privacy as a kind of common value, rather than simply as something that some people might have more of and others might have less. And I think that sense of privacy is enormously important. Um, it's, uh, in this respect, privacy is a value like uh, freedom of expression. Uh, uh, freedom of expression, too, is uh, uh, in, in one way a divisible value. In other words, you might feel, and you might be correct, that you have uh, nothing to fear by uh, shooting off your mouth or putting forth your view. Uh, wh whereas other people might be greatly intimidated from doing so. So in some sense, there can be meaningful differences in the uh, extent to which individuals experience freedom of expression. But in a liberal view of uh, social life, we all depend on everyone's having some sense that they have the opportunity to squawk, for example, if things go wrong, that, that, that every sector of society uh, be reassured against threats, both real and imaginary, of dire consequences for expressing their opinions. So, in my view, uh, not an unusual view, I think, uh, it's, it would hardly be uh, a distortion to say uh, that we're not really enjoying freedom of expression if we ourselves are the only ones who feel free, if everyone else is scared to talk. And by the same token, uh, privacy is a value that we ought to defend uh, as a kind of source of common uh, reassurance and solidarity and um, permissiveness, like freedom of expression, uh, such that if we live in a world where most people most of the time feel that they've lost control of their personal information, and it can be taken over and used by the, the, the most uh, resourceful or the most clever party, uh, then I think we all lose. Um, this is, you know, not everybody agrees with this, but I think, uh, you know, I'd be prepared to defend that view at great length. So what this means is, I mean, it means many things, but uh, if we're serious about privacy in this kind of a holistic sense, the sense that uh, we all lose if, if a lot of people feel that they don't 
don't have privacy in this sense, even if we're good at defending our own privacy. If that's an important, uh, if that's an important sense of privacy to defend, then uh, we'd better worry about the common and uh, uh, reasonable assumptions of most people most of the time about what's happening to their personal information, uh, not just in the kind of world that we live in now, but in other nastier worlds, which unfortunately sometimes ensue. You know, the, the, the world today is, uh, has a lot of polities where people once thought that life was fairly predictable, and now it's not. Uh, there are, you know, there are very dangerous things happening. Uh, you've probably all heard about this, uh, the book by Evgeny Morozov about the use of social media for uh, tracking down and making life miserable for people in societies that uh, are uh, chronically authoritarian and some that have be that become authoritarian unexpectedly. Uh, that's a big loss even to people who are not themselves cracked down upon. So. What, what, what follows from all this? What, it, uh, lots of things, but, but above all, when the engineers have done their work and, and made, made the best possible uh, individual solutions available to individual users, the collective questions still remain, like uh, who ha what is the legal status of personal data? How long can it be kept? When must it be destroyed? When can people uh, exercise some kind of downstream right. right? If you don't like the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, kind of copyright over personal information, imagine some other institutional system that would grant people the ability to turn off information legally, not technologically, legally, uh, simply because they feel that it's been out there long enough and that it's, no one else has a legitimate interest in it. And these are questions which I, I, I submit are not, they're, they're enormously important, in, profound in my view, but they're not the kinds of questions that can be solved in, 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 as discrete questions for discrete viewers, uh, for users. They're, they're more, there are questions that can only be addressed through holistic, that is, society-wide uh, policies and laws. Right, okay. I think this is very close to what Frank was appealing for. Since we're almost going to run out of, question, and out of time for discussion, I would like to take two more questions and then pass it on to the panel, if that's okay with everyone. Um, I have Frederick and Simona, and then... Yeah. Um, I think that social networking sites today um, apply a, a kind of form of economic phishing, but not economic phishing as in phishing, the other phishing, PH. Um, in the sense that, that they provide a bait, the bait is the products that they, the, the products supposedly that they sell, like communication, entertainment, etc., whatever services it is that they provide through these uh, networks. And then in exchange, they, they basically abstract personal data. Um, they value people's privacy. So in a way, I think that social networking sites are economic phishing, just um, in disguise, obviously. And then that actually makes sense why people actually don't have an incentive to use a, a privacy software like Tor, as uh, was discussed before. Of course they don't have an incentive to use private software because they don't even realize the threat is there, as I mentioned, because basically it's all a question of phishing, I think. It's, it's a question of bait. It's a question of them thinking that they get, they're getting um, communication, uh, entertainment, whatever it is they're getting through social networking sites without necessarily having to get something in return when actually the trade-off is enormous when actually they're giving much, much more uh, away that their, their private lives, which, uh, their private information, which affects their lives in exchange for minimal communication time or whatever that is. So my question is, um, if, pe if people lack this incentive to uh, enhance their privacy through such software like, like Tor or Scramble or whatever, uh, why is it that tracking technologies, like the ones you proposed earlier, why would they be more effective than any other private software right now? In the sense that if people don't have the incentive to use this, the existing privacy software, why would they have the incentive to use these tracking technologies? Wouldn't that ultimately mean that, again, only a minority would be using tracking technologies? And in the other day, I mean, yes, it is important for a minority to use tracking technologies, but I think the real aim is to get the public to use them. Because in the other day, it's uh, an, an, a statistical analysis of public online data, which is the concern. So how can we... How can tracking te such tracking technologies actually be more effective than the current privacy software? Thank you. I have uh, Frederick here, and then Simona, 
and then Andy, I'm not sure who else. Sort of a synthetic uh, proposal for uh, solving one sort of problem which has been uh, given. Uh, I think it would be useful to have some sort of application or add-on which uh, would be independent of a browser, uh, those who make browsers independent, uh, which uh, visualize to the user what sort of information he leaks effectively now and what sort of threat it possibly gives. Uh, and the um, purpose would be to do that visually as simple as possible and even um, the detail could be um, variable for the user. So, somebody who is not very um, anxious could have a very simple uh, visualization what he is leaking. Somebody who is more anxious would have a more detailed uh, profile of what he is leaking. And uh, it could be a machine learning uh, program. That should be uh, okay. And for me, it would be best if that program was open source. <laughs> so that everybody can see that it's not lying. It does what it says it does. So it should be an independent program which could, if it uh, becomes somewhat hip to use that uh, program, and say, oh, I, I know how, what, what I'm doing, it could uh, have a somewhat uh, more spread usage and then Perhaps you could have more informed users uh, and know what users are really concerned about. Because otherwise, you are saying, well, users should be concerned about that. No, users should be concerned about that. So you'll know it. Thank you. <laughs> OK, thank you. That was a nice appeal to open source as a trust model, too. I think that's a discussion in itself that I hope that we can continue during the break, the latest. Um, Simone was first. Andy, if it's okay, if we can. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm sitting in the wrong spot. <laughs> I'm going to change after the break. I, I think what I want to say relates to the, to, to the former speaker. Because first, I'd like uh, to, to add a type of information. So going back to the beginning of the presentations, add a type of information to the ones that were already uh, given by uh, Ashkan. Uh, because I think there's a fourth, fourth type of information which is uh, unknowingly uh, and uh, unintentionally leaking uh, uh, data in, in a social setting, uh, which can happen. And it ties in with what uh, Dave was telling us about collapsed contacts, uh, contact, uh, co yeah, contacts and, and, and invisible audiences. So, so to give an example, when you're, and there are more examples, but when you're on Facebook and someone posts a message in, in a group chat because he or she wants to reach a large audience to tell something, and then afterwards you start using that group chat for, uh, uh, for private uh, chats. Uh, a lot of people will see that and you won't notice it. Uh, and and to, you, you can manage your privacy settings uh, uh, as strict as possible, but that doesn't help you because uh, uh, I have very strict privacy settings and, and these things still happen. So it's something which is within the, the design of, 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 of Facebook with, uh, I, I would call it the technology design, but maybe it's also the user interface. It, it's somewhere there that is not transparent. Uh, you're not seeing what's happening until people start telling you you're, what you're telling now is very private and we're all, you know, we're all reading uh, the stuff that you're, you're posting on Facebook. So there is something very non-transparent in the way these things are designed and, and, and you can manage your privacy settings as much as you like, but it won't help you if you're not aware of this. And, and many users aren't aware of this. And there are more examples uh, where this can happen, uh, especially on, on Facebook. Um, I had a question to, uh, to Frank, uh, and that, that was already mentioned by Sida as well. Who is defining the policies? Because I was very interested in that project. But who defines the policy in, in, that, uh, uh, in the project where you can use the secure web browser? 
Uh, and as a final remark about uh, what, what Ashkan was saying uh, uh, at the end, uh, about trusting these organizations. I don't trust these organizations at all uh, uh, for doing the things that are in my best interest. But, uh, you know, I use these services because they're uh, fun, uh, they're convenient, uh, and I try to mitigate the risks as best as I can, can by using, by managing my privacy settings, by using all kinds of plugins, uh, but I don't trust them at all. <laughs> you want to... Yeah, my question, um, I guess, connects with some of the other questions asked earlier. My question is this. To what extent do you agree or disagree that the key problem is how to communicate the benefits of alternative social networks and privacy-enhancing technologies? And a sub-question from that. Is should communications stroke branding specialists be working more closely with privacy-enhancing technologists? Second part, because we had a... Oh, sorry. sorry, okay. Yeah, so the second part of the question is, should communications, stroke branding specialists, be working more closely with privacy-enhancing technologists, such as yourselves? Okay, that's a good round of questions. Who would like to start? Ashkan, do you want to go? Sure. Um, I'll go in... I'll take James's question at the end and I'll just go through the other questions quickly. So on the second point of uh, incentives with regards to say um, more uh, kind of more aggressive tracking technologies, actually a lot of my work on flash cookies and e-tags and such um, would demonstrate that even though most people don't opt out and most people allow these tracking, um, it's a com the, the ecosystem is quite competitive. So the person that can say, I can guarantee 99% coverage, you know, so there's this, this bit of like, uh, it's called churn, which is people that opt out or delete cookies. So there's always like this 2 to 3% churn in the industry that was the common number. It's getting higher, fortunately. Uh, but the, the people could say, well, even those users we can measure accurately. And then their marketing materials would be like, we can track those pesky users that opt out. Right? And part of the reason you see a lot of effort or support around do not track um, in, from the lobbying side and from the industry side is that the worry is that if you make it really easy for people to opt out, this primary mechanism that a lot of the industry is using, which is just cookie-based, will go away and they'll have to take different approaches like browser fingerprinting or alternative mechanisms like being logged in. Um, so yes, you're right, most of the industry still relies on this old method, but there is incentives um, just to, you know, it's a few dollars, but one person can edge out the other person. Um, should I go through all the responses? Um, with regards to privacy enhancing tools, there's a bunch out there. So I built one called Mobile Scope that lets you see all of the data flows that your mobile phone sends. And uh, there's a lot of open source tools called Collusion that lets you see, um, you know, where, for example, what websites you, you, uh, your data goes to uh, and, and what information is transmitted. The problem is that, um, one, most people don't adopt them. Two, it's really hard to tell. Even from a security expert, I can't tell you that um, I can't give you the thumbs up for a particular site. I can say the known threats that I know about, this covers or does not cover, but there will always be new threats, and I can't give you, I can't say what particular privacy concern is gonna be of concern to you. So th those kind of things are hard, but I do think that helping users um, come up with tools that can help them make these decisions could help, possibly. One of the issues is the way you framed it is the information's already transmitted by the time you've been to the website, so that's not helpful either, right? So you might want to have something that tells you before you actually transmit the data what the exchange is going to be like. Um, on, the, on the point of uh, the, the one point I wanted to say is uh, on your point, the birthdays are a great example, right? So um, when someone, po you, you might not, Alessandro, you give this example all the time, where you might not want to post your birthday on your social network profile, but everyone wishes you a happy birthday, and they're revealing your information. There's actually a case, uh, story in the Wall Street Journal last week about a, 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 a gay woman who was outed because of people adding her to a, to a group. So this is a common issue. Um, and, uh, and then the, to the last point with regards to do I think alternative social networks will be, um, will be you know, are, are a good solution, I, I disagree in the sense that um, while I would love a privacy-preserving social network, the issue ultimately is network effects, right? So, you know, I can have the most awesome 
privacy preserving social network of one or even like this crowd and no offense to you guys, you guys are awesome, but if it doesn't let me connect to like my mom and post photos of these kind of things, I don't, I don't think I would use it as much as I would use the dominant social network just because the, so, the network effects are strong. So if you can solve that problem. Um, well, I guess that was kind of my point. Do you see it as a communicational issue and how we might kind of scale up? I mean, I think it's got all of the properties of network effects, which is, you know, first mover advantage, uh, you know, like type of adoption, once it grows, you know, once you're an incumbent in the network, it's very hard to switch, switching costs. There are a lot of other economic things bundled into it than just privacy issues. So I'll, I'll, those, those are... Okay. Okay. So let, let me start by saying that uh, getting five questions and answering them is difficult. <laughs> I need a wizard to help me just even remembering uh, what was asked. I'm mm -hmm. gonna go over some notes that I made during the questions, uh, hopefully addressing some of the points. So first to the first uh, speaker who, who, who pointed us to privacy as more a societal value. Um, yes, uh, I think we are losing it. Uh, so that's a part of the, as a technologist, I. I Thank you. As a technologist, I think it's uh, uh, an observation that the, the privacy of the society as a whole is going down because of the way in which we use uh, online social networks and other internet-related uh, technologies. Uh, and I think, but you already said that, I think the, the way to deal with that is the legal system. So I, I, I don't think, as a technologist, I'm in a position to, to, uh, to, to address that strongly. Uh, there was a second point made by somebody that wh why these um, things like Tor are not used. It's because it's economic phishing and people don't realize that, that, they, are, um, that, that they are leaking information. Uh, so yes, to some point that is, I agree to that, I agree with that, but not completely. I think it's a more complicated picture than that. Uh, I think there are also positive aspects to, to uh, tracking. So some people like targeted advertising. Uh, the people in this room may not believe it, but actually a significant fraction People like that, so it's not just economic phishing. And in addition, te even the technologies of tracking, so being able to identify your browser, have good uses too. I think Seda mentioned that. So for example, banks can use this to detect phishing attacks. Uh, if, if, if at once you are accessing your bank account from a completely different browser than you're used to, well, the fact that they can fingerprint your browser may help them detect that. So I think the, the picture is more complicated and I think the, the, the fact that people are not all using Tor is not only because they they're not they're not aware that their information is being used as, as uh, is being extracted from them as a kind of money in an economic fishing attempt. Uh, um, with respect to the add-on that visualizes leaks, uh, I, I agree with this. Uh, this is a good idea. Uh, I think uh, Ashkan already mentioned that. I think it's also tricky. Uh, so you should not put too much trust in such an. But but anything that increases awareness will will have value. On the other hand. Um, it also depends on the threat model, because if you think about anybody who's really wanting to uh, extract information, the only visualization that's simple and correct right now is you're leaking everything. Um, you're leaking everything. You should just have a picture, because uh, I think 3 to 4% of PCs today are infected with malware, um, which is operating system level sniffing software that can access everything you have on your PC. So in 3 to 4% of the cases, you're potentially leaking everything. So you shouldn't put too much faith in these kinds of visualizations. They're, they're an awareness raising tool, but they're not, I mean, they, they cannot be perfect, uh, even if they're open source and, and reviewed and so forth. And then, of course, I have to come back on the question uh, on Flowfox with, uh, with the, who sets the policies. That's a very good question. Uh, from a technological point of view, I could say, I don't care. I mean, anybody could set them. I think it depends on the context. There are some uh, application scenarios for which we have a good idea on who could set the policy. I give you one example there. Um, so one of the, the case studies we did is um, you have a social network, Facebook, and third-party apps. Um, then uh, the one who sets the policy is the, the online social network provider, so Facebook. So they have all your information and what you want to control is how it flows to the third-party apps. So, in a sense, that's a simple situation because there is a technically smart uh, entity that can set the policy for you. But, of course, many people will say, okay, uh, but we, we don't want to trust Facebook for that. So, you may have other scenarios where, as an end user, you want to control how your information leaks. Then you run into the problem that, of course, end users cannot write such policies easily. I mean, it, this is, this is diffi it's difficult to write a good policy and then uh, how to solve that 
is less clear to me. Uh, it could be that uh, consumer organizations uh, or browser vendors or uh, help in setting up good configurations of that, but I, I don't have a, a, a answer that you can use tomorrow. I think in some scenarios, this, the policy can be set by basically a website owner to make sure that the information you share with that website doesn't leak elsewhere. I think these are the easy scenarios and they're already useful. If you want to go beyond that, I'm not sure who should set the policy uh, um, today. Did you want to say something? Um, <clears throat> oh, they, these guys have done such a good job in answering, but um, I think in terms of the, uh, making things more transparent and making providing better feedback for the users, these things are, are very important as well for the... I mean, ultimately, the decision of whether you put something on the web or not is the user's decision, whether or not you, uh, you know, users can be engineered to put things they shouldn't put on there. Ultimately, it is their decision, so informing them better and making the context of their interaction with the web more transparent, I think these things are important, in my opinion. <laughs> can I add one quick thing to that? Yes, I think another place that we're missing the opportunity is the other way, actually, is getting feedback from users to technologists and to websites and to regulators, right? So there's an opportunity. We have assumptions on what we care about. We think the leakage of information is important, for example, perhaps that no one cares at all about the leakage information. So some ability to capture user feedback for the things they find problematic or creepy once they understand them, whether it's the site's practices or some, some sort of engagement that they experience on the web. Um, I think that's a really good opportunity because those data points actually um, feed the press, feed policymakers, and feed technologists on what tools we build and how we allocate resources and what policy outcomes we push for. So. I think that's a very good point. We should do that immediately. We can even lie about it, but just to see how people react if you say, now this is leaking to... to I think that's a very interesting proposal. Maybe we should do it in Spion. Okay, good. Claudia? I'll, I'll very shortly because I think we are over time already. So, um, yeah, uh, Dave just mentioned that it's users who decide to put inf information in the web, but and uh, in relation to the transparency uh, tools that uh, you were calling for, I, I, I do think we, we have to keep in mind that a lot of information about users is not information users willingly upload to the web. So there is the be, the, the whole behavioral information is, I think, even maybe even bigger than, than explicit information. So that's one thing. About transparency, there are a number of tools who try to do that. Uh, it is not really easy because you always have to leave some things out and what you include and how you visualize it. There are lots of decisions that I think Seda was mentioning uh, in the beginning that, that there are assumptions and normative uh, decisions that are made about what to show and not. And, and the other thing is that if you're showing people what they are leaking, but they don't really have any means to do anything about it, then I think that can also be quite frustrating. So I, if, if you're shown something that bad that is happening and then you have like something you can do, that's nice, but if not, I'm not sure it's going to have much of a, of a use apart from desensitizing people to this problem. <clears throat> and just to, to, to conclude, um, I, so I hear on the one hand Ashkan saying that these tracking uh, companies are trying to develop more sophisticated algorithms for tracking people who opt out in all possible ways. So to me, that kind of attitude makes it very difficult to have this vision of trusting corporations as the future for being safe and, and private. That's it. Okay, just shortly before closing this panel, I do have the feeling that uh, transparency may potentially depress our users and, <laughs> and, and, and it turns out while the regulators in Europe are calling for privacy by design, saying we can't just do this legally, the technologists are saying we can't do this either. So <laughs> not to close on that note, I think we have actually heard about a lot of interesting technologies, technological interventions. Um, and future looking. I do point out to you, Laurie Craner is in the room. She's the maker of P3P together with W3C. And I hope that in the afternoon she can also capture some questions on 
you know, what are the what are the issues or political issues at, on the one hand, defining the categories of a policy, but also making it work in the real world. Um, I don't know if this is what she'll be talking about, but maybe we can carry some of those questions to that session. I must admit, we did not talk about big data and analytics and all of that, although I think those were some of the themes that we had yesterday. Um, we did look a lot, I would agree with James, of, at information that emanates from the individual, the first kind of contact, although a lot of information is collected otherwise or managed and processed otherwise. And I hope that uh, in Spion in the second half, we can also look at some of these questions. Thank you so much for your patience. We started a bit later and we're a bit over time. Enjoy your lunch and do not forget to go to the tete a tete. Uh, I must also announce that uh, the team who made the web 2.0 suicide machine, the art, arts group Modder, are also here and they're going to premiere with us their new project called Commodify Us. So please do catch, catch a moment with the tete a tete people and enjoy your lunch. Thank you.